Today, we will be talking with a cancer survivor turned thriver turned educator. As a matter of fact, Karen Dugan opened the nation's first plant-based culinary education center. You may know her better as STL Veg Girl. That's St. Louis, not Seattle. She is an extraordinary human being with one extraordinary story to tell. And so I'm so very excited that Karen is here with us on the exam room today. Karen, so good to see you. Chuck, it is my utmost pleasure to be with you today. I'm a longtime listener, first time caller, <laughs> and so excited to get the conversation rolling. Oh, you just tickled the old radio heartstrings in me. Um, you know, before we get going, I must say, Dr. Jim Loomis, our friend, my colleague here, your colleague, um, is just one of your biggest advocates. He has been in my ear for literally years saying, you have to get Karen on the show. You have to get Karen on the show. She's got a great story herself, but really what she's doing out in St. Louis is unlike anything I've ever seen before. So I'm really excited to have a first time story to tell on the program because uh, really once he explained what it is you are doing, he was absolutely right. I've never heard of anything quite like this before. So it is my honor to have you here. But before we get into uh, what's going on in St. Louis, I want to get into what's happening with you, because as is the case with so many of the extraordinary guests who have been on the exam room over the years, your mission is really quite personal. And I want to flash uh, forward or flashback, I should say, back to when you were growing up. Because looking at you today, Karen, uh, you seem to be an extraordinarily healthy human being. You have this nice, healthy glow to your skin. Um, looks like you don't have a health care in the world, but you were once known as, and I quote, the human garbage disposal. And so when I hear those three words in succession, I'm thinking, well, that's probably not somebody that was eating the healthiest of diets. And you're saying that was you. So back in the day, what was going on with you? Well, I know, you know, it, it didn't even phase me to put that on my website because I was so used to my best girlfriend saying that about me, you know, oh, give it to Karen, she'll eat it, you know? Um, and I, I was never first of all, I will say I never really had a weight problem. Um, I mean, you know, I always went up and down, but um, never really had a, a big weight problem. But and we're not here to talk about metabolism. But I gotta tell you, I wasn't scared to eat anything. Um, and uh, I, I, I think that uh, that was probably probably had something to do with my diagnosis, my diagnosis later in 2008. And also just that every single fall, winter, I would get this awful, I mean, I, I mean, I would, I'm going to say flu, but I don't think that it was the flu. It was this awful cold. And I was just in bed for seven to 10 days. I'm not even kidding you. Every single year. It was just like clockwork. I knew it was coming. And of course the seasonal al allergies and the little aches here and there. But just as you get older, you just think, ah, eh, it's part of, you know, growing up or getting older. And um, but when I changed my diet, all that went away. So it, it's just really been quite a journey. And, and you know, we, we can kind of get into the into whatever you'd like, actually. The, so I used to get sick with the same thing all the time as well. And I knew that like the second I felt it, I could identify it. I was like, oh, no, I Here know where this is going. Was it the same for you? Oh, totally. It was like a Mack truck was just down the road about to about to just really run into you. And you remember when that would happen, you think, OK, I have to do everything that I need to do right now before I get sick. I need to hurry up and get the laundry done, get the dishes done, go, go do all these little things, because I know that I'm going to be in bed for seven to ten, 10 days, really, really sick. It, it just it was inevitable. Oh, 100%. And I used to load up on orange juice or emergency packets, which never oh. really managed to do a daggone thing for me. But nonetheless, that was kind of what I would do each and every time, even though I really didn't do, do a bit of good. Did you have a, I mean, outside of making sure all of your chores were done, did you have a routine like that? Are you kidding, Chuck? I took those fake meds also. <laughs> Come on. I just wish I would have bought stock in the company. Oh my goodness. Oh man. So beside from being the human garbage disposal, what was your, what was your diet like? Was it the standard American diet? Lots of high fat food, junk food, fast food? 
Well, I'll tell you. So um, I am a kid of the late 70s, early, uh, early mid 80s. And both of my, my parents worked. My mom worked full, part time, but still, you know, I, I, she was never, listen, my mom's my best friend. I love her to pieces, but she was not a cook at all. So I don't, I didn't, my brother and I, we didn't grow up around, you know, these elaborate dinners and great chef prepared or even well cooked <laughs> meals growing up. Um, we just ate what was put in front of us and then we wanted to go out and play or be with our friends or whatever. So um, we never equated, I never equated food with health or food with, you know, uh, sickness, illness. Um, so for example, and I mean, I think that people m my age-ish probably grew up around the same things like Campbell's, you know, um, canned soups, Velveeta grilled cheese. Yum. I would still eat one today if I thought that it was okay. Uh, my dad and I, one of my best memories actually is on Sunday afternoons when my dad and I would watch um, either golf or football. And not that I even liked those sports, but I just liked like hanging out with him. And we had this little 13 inch black and white TV in the kitchen. And he would make one of two things, either um, fried bologna sandwiches mm, or fried spam sandwiches. Then we would top it with melted Velveeta and God knows what that really is. Put it on white bread and either put ketchup or mustard on it. I mean, I, just such great memories, you know? So, and anytime I ever had anything green, it was probably overcooked broccoli um, with some kind of, you know, melted cheese or something on it. So not the best diet growing up. No, it, it wouldn't say so. I will say though, I was also a fan of fried bologna sandwiches back in the day. My grandma used to make those for my brother and I from time to time. And I remember getting so excited when she would take the the little red, I guess, casing off of the the, the trim of the bologna. Um, you had to take that off before you ate it. And then we would uh, eat that with the white bread, Wonder Bread or Mary Jane bread, you know, just as white huh? as it could possibly be with American cheese, not Velveeta. We didn't go gourmet like the Dugan house, but um, <laughs> but it was a, a nice slice of American cheese, the cheaper, the better. And when I took a bite of it, it seemed like absolute heaven at the time. But now, but now, I mean, what, <laughs> what? I wouldn't use the term heaven whatsoever. What term would you would you use? I, I'm maybe just like one dimensional. Mm, one yeah. dimension. Yeah, I can see that. I can see that. Uh, yeah, one dimensional. Fat or, and mushy. Yeah. Mm. Salty, you know, <laughs> just all all those those words that you really don't want associated with with the food that you're eating. But the yeah. memories are there. You know, Chuck, you wouldn't get rid of those memories for anything. You know, that's, no. No. part of, of who you are, you know, and those, you know, now we know, but um, I'm thankful that I went through all that with my dad, you know, no question about it, because it, it made you the person that you are today. Yeah. I think that one of the, you know, and, and this is kind of a sidebar, but I think that one of the things that we start to realize as we get healthier on this journey of ours is that our relationships aren't necessarily with those foods all of the time. I think that it's with those memories you were just talking about, right? So the bologna sandwiches to you represent and, and spam sandwiches represent happy times with your dad. You could have had just as happy of a time, you know, with carrots and hummus come to think of it. Wouldn't you say? Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, I would rather not equate bad foods with those memories, but the, but it's the memories that stick stronger than the foods themselves, but still they are kind of, you know, they are tied together. It's some, you know, by some kind of way. Um, but you're absolutely right. And I think that that's something that hopefully with the evolution and strength behind a plant-based diet that we're seeing more and more, hopefully those new memories are being made with people. Really the, the, uh, the backings of good food, good nutrition, and those healthy relationships. Let's talk about good nutrition. I pulled up the ingredients from Velveeta cheese, just for oh. those of you who are curious. And if they could fit more dairy into this, I would be surprised. Uh, from the package, uh, whey, milk, milk protein concentrate, modified food starch, canola oil, sodium citrate, and then 
it contains 2% or less of the following. This is typically where the scariest stuff is buried. Yeah. Uh, gelatin, salt, calcium phosphate, sodium phosphate, lactic acid, sorbic acid as a preservative. Here we go, more dairy, milk fat, cheese culture, paprika extract, and annatto for color, enzymes, natural flavor. Never really say what that natural flavor is, but it's in there. Vitamin A and uh, palmitate. So I'm not quite sure what a lot of that stuff is, but there's your Velveeta cheese. Mm, that's right. Picture of health right there. I'm telling you. No. Um, so let's, okay, let's take a turn here. So how would you consider, you know, over the years as you grew into being an adult, you said you never really struggled with your weight. Um, and, and we will get into your cancer diagnosis momentarily, but before then and, and your annual sickness, were there any other health struggles that you were facing? I really didn't have any. I mean, I was, a, well, to say I was a pretty healthy person. I mean, that's up for debate now because I would get sick most years and then I had these allergies and everything else. Um, and then eventually cancer, um, times two, by the way. Um, so one thing that I have realized over the years, um, and I, I, I find myself saying more and more often to people, especially people who come into classes, you know, I, health, good health is not the absence of, of symptoms. You know, we just, I think that we just learn to live with these these symptoms, these little aches and sneezes and limitations little by little. And, you know, unless we're in the hospital or we're taking a medication for something, then we think that, you know, everything's fine. Everything's status quo. Let's go. You know, and it, that's just not true. Absolutely. It's funny, like feeling sick kind of becomes the norm. And it was a, a former colleague of mine, a guy by the name of Eric O'Gray, no. Uh, who in his own weight loss journey explained it best. He said, you know, when I started to feel really good, I went to the doctor and I was talking about how great I was feeling. You know, something must be wrong. I'm feeling this good. And he said, the doctor said to him, she said, uh, no, Eric, you feel normal. And so normal is feeling good. Like we are inherently supposed to feel good, but we normalize feeling sick because of just, our diet, our lifestyle, the stress, just so many, so many reasons that can compound or, or manufacture just this, this unhealthy life. So many of us lead. Um, if you, if you see somebody who's like, Oh, I feel great. I've changed my diet. I've done this, or I'm getting more sleep and I'm, you know, doing all these, you know, wonderful lifestyle changes. And you think, well, that shouldn't, uh, to your point, that shouldn't be weird. That's normal. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. So many ill people, who all feel about the same and are all making the same, I don't want to say excuses because that just indicates that, you know, they do know, right? Yep. I think that people, a lot of people just don't know. And until they're educated, then they do know. But it's just when I see people come through the shop and they've changed their, you know, through maybe education here or through PCRM or anywhere, you know, and they just feel fantastic. They're just so surprised. And I'm just not. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, for them. Totally for them. Yeah, you know, but it's funny though, the way that we, the, the majority of people are, are looking at food. And I think that once you kind of cross over into the realm where you and I are right now, it's, it's hard to unsee things. Yeah. Um, but I'll, I'll give you a, a prime example of one that really stuck with me recently was I was out to dinner um, with a group of people and a uh, salad came with it, and this was after they had crushed appetizers like fried mozzarella sticks and, um, you know, something probably not getting them off on the healthiest foot. And then uh, this person begins to eat salad, and they're like, well, I'm not going to finish my salad because then I won't have room for this entree that they ordered, which was just as meaty and as cheesy as it possibly could be. And I'm just, I'm laughing to myself knowing that that's really not the place to have the conversation with the person about that. But what stuck with me, Karen, was that I was like, well, maybe if you ate that salad, you wouldn't want then to crush that big meat heavy, dairy heavy entree that you just ordered that's got close to a thousand calories and God only knows how many grams of fat. Right. And so, you know, you start to look at things a little bit differently. And I kind of wonder if this person looked at things the same way, if then they wouldn't have that annual illness that you were talking about, they wouldn't have 
those stomach aches and uh, all of the other things that they typically will complain about, you know, are there instances like that throughout your day where you're just like, yep, the old me would have been 100% on track with what that person just said. But now I just see things on a completely different level. Well, I, yes. So interestingly enough here, and I'm sitting and broadcasting today um, with you from the Center for Plant-Based Living in St. Louis. We do a lot of things, classes, virtual and shop, all that kind of stuff. But another thing that we offer that really just kind of started to organically happen um, when, once the pandemic started to kind of shift downwards, which is good. So we have dinner parties here. And last night we had a birthday party here and um 70th birthday party this woman and her husband have been coming in um for several months and um she has lost weight she feels great uh he uh her husband is no longer on metformin um prostate levels back down to where they should be looking great feeling great so um and i believe that he's 70 or somewhere around there uh they look fantastic well so they brought in family and friends um, to this, to her birthday party last night, none of them are plant-based. And, um, I'm happy to say that they all ate a lot of their food, were very complimentary. Um, it, it was a great night, but there was one woman here who, um, she's like, yeah, this was great food. I totally appreciate it. I understand. I get it. Um, but I cannot wait to have a steak. And I was like, Okay, you know, like that's fine. I mean, it it it, it hurts me a little bit um, because when you say you get it, you don't. It's hard to like have a leg on either side of the fence, and yeah. you know, and, yeah. and like, but 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 it's still okay because she appreciated the food and she had a hundred percent plant based animal free meal, and I hope that maybe she woke up this morning feeling a little bit different in a good way. You know, we are all just little, you know, little, little instances along the way to helping people. You know, I'm not going to do something overnight. You're not going to do something overnight to help anybody. You know, maybe we will, maybe we won't, but chances are we won't. It's little messages along the way that help people get to a place where they understand how they can help themselves through diet and nutrition. Absolutely. It, it takes lots of those little messages for somebody to make one big change, I think, you know, so that that could be message number one for that person, right? And who knows what else is coming down the pike that that may continue them on a healthier journey, right? So, you know, how often do you go out and buy something because you see or you hear or you read that advertisement for the first time? Right. Not very often, right? You got to see that ad four, five, six times before you're like, oh, I need that in my life. And so hopefully there will be more advertisements, quote unquote, for this person um, to continue down that healthier road. But I want to talk more about your story. And um, I want to ask you about the year 2008 uh, to say that that would be a transformative year for you would be an understatement. How would you sum up that year in one sentence? Man, that was a tough year. Yeah, yeah. I, I bet. So in 2008, um, let's first talk about your father who you just, you know, spoke glowingly of, you know, uh, watching golf, watching football with that little TV, making the spam or bologna sandwiches. Um, his health took a turn for the worse that year. What happened? Well, so, and I think that this is, is important and I don't really talk about it um, hardly at all is, my dad had prostate cancer and by the time he was diagnosed his levels exceeded 1700 his psa level was in excess of 1700 and usually you hear anywhere between zero and four scooting up to five maybe six okay now it's time for surgery or some kind of some kind of therapy and my dad um, which is, it's a little weird because he was, most of his friends were doctors and lawyers. He was a salesman. I don't really know how that happened, but when he needed to see a doctor professionally, he had white coat syndrome and which just means he did not want to go see them professionally. Don't tell me anything's wrong. So my dad, um, passed away at the age of 60, but, uh, the physicians, uh, his oncologist said that he had, um, 
he was diagnosed at 55, but he probably had cancer for five years already. So prostate cancer, uh, for some who may not know, is uh, called a lazy cancer because it moves very slowly. And as long as you monitor it, you can kind of decide with your medical team if you really need um, some kind of medical intervention or, or, or what. But when you are at 1700, it's, it's you know, we've we're past the the point of no return. So um, they gave him five more years and he took four and a half of them and um, walked me down the aisle. So that's good. But um, so I, I just, I think maybe this is also just a little plug for um, go get yourself checked. You know, um, you have, this is such a slow, lazy cancer that, you know, it's not like if you do have prostate cancer or any kind of elevated prostate level, it doesn't mean you're going to, you know, it's a death sentence by any stretch, especially if you're in single digits. Um, but, you know, it is, you know, just just kind of watch it. So that's my two cents on that. Um, but he um, he passed away in 2008 and um then 10 weeks after he was diagnosed, 10 weeks after he passed away, excuse me, I was diagnosed. Now, I did not have prostate cancer. That's a whole different podcast. Um, I had malignant melanoma. And um, I, listen, sun worshiper, but still I'm landlocked here in St. Louis. So it's not like I'm always at, in the center and at the beach. Um, but, you know, again, I'm a child of the late 70s, early 80s, and, um, you know, baby oil and in the sun one or two weeks in the summer for summer vacation when you would get in the in the uh the uh the car and, and head down to the nearest beach um i didn't do myself any favors and um if i knew that i was damaging myself if my mom knew that it was really going to cause something then she wouldn't have let me do it so we live and learn however i have done a number uh i've done a lot of research on skin cancer and diet so now what i'm doing is i'm not completely scared of the sun it is it actually you know, for vitamin D levels, especially, um, I want to get it. And it is nice to have just a little bit of color. It makes you feel good. I just don't spend hours and hours outside and I eat well to help or to hopefully bolster my immune system enough so that I don't get cancer again. Well, you're talking about two very different forms of cancer, but nonetheless, I mean, coming just 10 weeks after your father's passing to receive that diagnosis, that must've been some kind of a gut punch. Well, I'll tell you, you know, I didn't grow up in a family who even had, I didn't know anyone who passed away or even had cancer in my family. I didn't know none of my friends had cancer. I didn't really, I wasn't familiar with it, you know? So when you hear that somebody as close to you as a parent has cancer, and by the way, there's no recovering from it, and then you watch them pass away. I mean, he literally passed away in, in my brother's arms and my arms and my mom's arm. We were all holding him as he passed away. And and then to turn around and get the, the a same sort of diagnosis, you think, well, <laughs> what is happening here? So it was, it, it really, um, it was the impetus, you know, that really got me. And it, it was, it was the one, two punch that I needed because just losing my dad wouldn't have have brought me here it, i would have just gone through the mourning process and tried to heal um but having cancer myself i i got to a point where pardon me but i was pissed yeah. you know I, I i was i was i thought no 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 i am not ready there is more work to be done so let's figure it out so, yeah. So what was that? I mean, that that moment for you where the light bulb went off when things started to click like, wow, you know, I have a whole lot more control over this than I ever previously knew. Um, do you do you remember? Was there one single moment where that that light switch was flipped and you had that big epiphany? Um, I think. OK, so here's the thing. So when i went in for treatment and i had the tumor removed um and i was i was healing from that i think it was a culmination of a lot of things chuck because i was healing from surgery my husband and i were in the middle of a whole home renovation that we were doing ourselves by the way and i mean like took everything down to the studs um, i was trying to be a good daughter to my mom, a good sister to my brother to my brother a good wife to my husband i was working full time 
in a medical practice, by the way. Mm. Um, and I couldn't get away from my life, you know? So what I, I think that I did is I kind of found a way to fight through and break through. And what I mean by that is I just wanted to educate myself. I thought, okay, I'm not finished here. This is not how the story ends. So I started, and I'm not even kidding you. I started Googling Dr. Google and just putting in, you know, cancer prevention and disease prevention and all these things. And, um, oh, and, and I started putting diet also, even though I wasn't really in, I didn't, still was not making the connection between food and health. And so I'm Googling and I'm Googling and I'm like, I don't even know what I'm doing. Like, I don't even know what I'm doing. I'm just grabbing at things. And what kept generating, the results that kept generating were the benefits of a vegan diet. And I was like, really? Like, come on. Like, here I am again, middle of the country, 2008. Nobody said plant-based then. They said vegan. And this is a very conservative town. So when you, back then, when I heard, whenever somebody heard the word vegan, it was like, okay, crazies. Uh, I've learned a lot since and no disrespect. I mean, you know, um, but uh, I thought, no, that's, there's, there's no way, there's no way I could give up my Velveeta, my chicken breasts, my, you know, like my frozen foods that I need to eat because they're quick in the microwave. And um, so I kept reading and reading. And then in this medical practice, I was the marketing director. I made friends with a few doctors and I said, listen, I'm not quite sure how to read these medical studies. I mean, you, you have to learn how to do that. And um, I said, Would you, you know, can you guys teach me how to do this? So in some off time, these physicians taught me how to read these medical studies. So then I had those tools and it was easy for me to just zip through all these medical journals, all these papers, all these studies. And hand to God, Chuck, all I was looking for was the paper that said, no, 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 no. That's bunk. Plants aren't going to save you. Keep, keep looking, you know, I mean, and I'm, listen, I'm still looking for that paper. It doesn't exist. So I thought, fine, fine. Science says, okay. And I knew that I didn't want to do this forever, but I at, I was still reaching at things and I wanted to find the one thing that I could hang on to. So in one fell swoop, I took all the animal products out of my, out of my kitchen, made my husband real happy and um, went to the grocery store and put all the things that I was supposed to put in my, in my cart, went to the produce section, all the colors. And I was also at this point, I was looking at PCRM. That was actually the, one of the first websites that I really dug into. So I was eating the rainbow, right? I was putting the green things in and the orange things in and the purple things in and the, the blue, th all the colors in the cart. I had no idea what I was putting in my cart. No idea, nothing had labels on it, things I hadn't eaten before in my life or that I didn't think that I'd eaten. So then I go over to the bean aisle, oh, beans are good. It has this thing called fiber. Okay, does it have enough protein though, right? You know, so throwing all that in the cart, uh, canned tomatoes were okay, I guess. Then I went over to the bakery and um, now I had, I will say, I will say that I have graduated from the white bread to the brown bread, which means nothing I know. But to me, I, I felt okay about that. Well, wasn't good enough this time. I had to go get what I was calling the hippie loaf. You know, the doorstop, the five pound <laughs> thing, right? Heaved that into the cart. And I got home and I put it all out on the, you know, this makeshift counter because again, we were rehabbing. I really didn't have a kitchen. And I thought, well, shoot, now what do I do? I didn't know what to do. Nothing, again, nothing had microwavable instructions. Nothing had, there wasn't too many ingredients. So I, you know, I started, I started Googling plant-based 101 recipes or, or whatever, and just started assembling food. I was no cook. I was just assembling food. So that, that's really how the whole thing got started. And uh, I thought that perhaps I would only read just enough studies to get from, to that point to assemble food, but something, something hooked on to me and uh, I, I couldn't stop reading the studies and it was the science that really brought me all the way to present day. It's fascinating stuff once you get uh, kind of down that rabbit hole uh, with with health journals um, that there is just so much literature there and you're right it's like you want to keep 
you know, digging and digging and digging and looking for that one study that you said, well, well, plants aren't the answer, except, you know, when those studies are purported, that evidence is purported, I say purported because then you can kind of go in and you can kind of debunk it, right? I think with the vast majority of the studies out there that point to plants being the healthiest food out there, um, that that's independent research, right? It's not exactly backed by the corn council or anything like that, um, as a lot of the beef and the dairy and the, you know, uh, other studies pointing to, you know, butter is back, you know, or have a lot of industry funding to them. Um, I think when you get into the real independent studies, which is uh, the, <laughs> you'll like this analogy, the meat and potatoes of uh, where uh, <laughs> the true health literature lies, you know, it, it all points to this healthier way of eating a, a plant-based diet. Um, so that's that's really cool. And I know that eventually in your journey also, Karen, um, you decided to become a food for life instructor as well. You, you really kind of ingrained yourself in the physicians committee culture. I have, yeah, and I'm really proud of that. I mean, only, truly the work that you guys do is just, you guys have set the bar so high and I've been so proud to be a member for so long. So in 2000, so uh, let's see, that was 2008, yeah, so 2008. Okay, picture this, St. Louis, 2008, you know, and Tim and Karen are redoing their house. And we this was this was the schedule. Get up in the morning, we go to our separate gyms, work out, come home, take showers, get dressed, go to corporate America, come home, put on gross clothes, and then just start pulling down walls and you know, doing all kinds of gross stuff. Now that was that was during this time of healing, okay? Trying to heal this big incision in my arm, still dealing with the loss of my dad, all of these things, okay? Now, also, I've always been the one to make dinner. And I mean, like, make dinner, ha ha, <laughs> you know, like heat up something. Well, in this new diet that I was trying, hate that word, but you understand, of assembling food, Tim and I would work after on the house after work and then eat dinner around 10, 10 30 at night, when, which is when our news comes on and then go, go to bed late. So that was the schedule for a very long time. And so when I would make dinner, I was just assembling food because I didn't really have time to do much research on how to cook. When was I going to cook? When was I going to learn to cook? You know, and mm. now in, in what I do now, these are all obstacles that I help people with. So I'm like, yep been there, done that. Let's talk about it. So I am sitting, my husband, Tim, God love him. He's sitting on this couch and he's full of plaster dust and I'm full of plaster dust and we just need something to eat before we go to bed. And I'm throwing food on a, on a plate and he's sitting down and I give him this food and he looks up at me with his big puppy dog eyes and he, and I mean, tension is so high, so high, not, it's just, there's just a lot going on. And he looks at me and I said, Tim, what, what, please, what, what? He goes, Karen, I understand what you're doing with this food. It makes a lot of sense. I understand it, but you're going to kill us both. <laughs> <laughs> I said, and it was just kind of like that release, that, that, that ugly cry. And I said, I know, I'm sorry. I know it sucks. I'm so sorry. I'm so bad at this. I don't know what I'm doing. I really don't know if this is going to help. I don't know if this is going to help me not get cancer again. I don't know. Like, I don't know anything right now, you know? And uh, he's like, oh, it's fine. It's, we're going to, we're going to be fine. Don't worry about it. And with that, hot sauce of everything. And we ate the food. So <laughs> you're gone, right? So without me even knowing it, the next day he looks for a vegan cooking class in St. Louis. I didn't even think about taking a class because guess what? I was not going to do this forever. And again, no time. So he finds this cooking class. It's at Whole Foods. And we get in. We're the last two people to get in. Uh, full class. The instructor was awesome. We're still friends. She's slinging plants left and right. We're all having a good time. She's using like five or six ingredients for everything. All these meals we're tasting. And I'm like, ah, that's okay. Like, I, I think I can maybe do this for a little while longer. She calls me after class, asked me to be her assistant because she could see how excited I was. And I thought, well, that's, I, oh, wow. So just two weeks, two, t two classes a month, we would go to these two Whole Foods in town and I was her pack mule and I would bring all of the ingredients and the recipes and do the dishes and just learn through her. Fast forward, 
2011, she goes, she moves, she moves out of town because her husband has transferred something. Whole Foods says to me, oh, well, would you like to teach? And I said, no, I'm sorry. I've never taught anybody anything, nor do I want to. And they said, okay, well, here's the paperwork. And um, I thought that's, no, you guys don't understand. So I get home, Tim's like, oh my gosh, you have to do this. I said, hi, have we met? I'm not gonna teach anyone anything. He said, okay, let's fill it out. <laughs> so that's how STL Veg Girl was born. And I can remember, oh my God, Chuck, after my first class, I just, I still like get sweaty from it because I was so nervous. If people were coming in, they, they were spending their time and money with me to learn something. And it made me, I mean, you want to talk about imposter syndrome to the nth degree. It was after that class, I went back to the PCRM website because I remember something about training and I dug around a little bit and it was the food for life program. I read all the way through it and I thought, wow, that is really something because they talk, I mean, you know what it's all about, but helping us as instructors, helping us communicate the health benefits between a plant-based diet and health for diabetes, for cancer, for wellness, for children's, for, you know, employee wellness, all these things. And I thought, well, I don't know if I want to like build a business around this, but this seems like really comprehensive stuff. Like this is a big deal. Well, back in the day, this is all before it went, went virtual. I had to, you have to like try out for this. Like this is, this is not, here's my money. I'll be on the next plane. You have to be legit into this. So you had to be on a plant-based diet for health reasons for at least two years. I had a two and a half hour phone call with somebody. I don't even know who it was. Um, a, you had to do a video of yourself cooking one of the PCRM recipes. That was challenging. <laughs> um, and then three letters of recommendation from people who are not friends or family or coworkers. And then like some kind of other application. But it was like, it was a big deal. I spent a lot of time on this and then I was accepted. And then you have to get there. You know, you have to pay your way. You have to do all the things. And then I can remember getting back on the plane on the way back to St. Louis. And I was like, oh my gosh, I hope no one says anything to me because I have all of this information in my head and I'm trying to organize it in such a way that I sound like an intelligent human being when I start to regurgitate it out and hopefully help people. <laughs> but it is, it is the most, it is the greatest training. I, I, I encourage anyone to go through it. It is, it'll change your life, your whole outlook and it'll really help you become a much better communicator, instructor, teacher. Boy, if that isn't the sales pitch, I don't know what is, uh, but very accurate. Um, that That is so very true. Um, I, I help out with those the trainings now, and uh, I've never seen a more dedicated group of individuals. And it's because we want people who are going to be like you, enthusiastic and fired up and really just want to get out there, teach those courses and better their community, you know, and, and, and as I say on the show all the time, you know, help people do what they feel is impossible and that's take charge of their health, which it's not yeah. impossible. It just takes a little bit of coaching and that's where the food for life instructors come in and they're doing just that. And that's now what you're doing on an even larger level with the uh, plant-based culinary education center. Uh, let, let's talk about this. So uh, you, you again, you take all of your chips, you put them right into the middle of the table. You go back to the uh, casino. You say, hey, casino, let me get some more chips. I'm going to push those into the middle of the table as well. Lo and behold, now we have this culinary education center. Talk to me about what's happening now. Wow. Okay. So I did a lot of things between 2011 and 2017, personal chef, all kinds of things, just trying to find my way in this whole plant-based world and still using my PCRM education and I will say, by the way, I just I have to say this one thing, and I think this is such a, a such a cool thing that I think PCRM I don't know about. About two days after I got off the plane from PCRM, our cancer support community called me, and the executive director called me and said, "Karen, can you please come in for a meeting?" I said, "Well, yeah, sure, okay." Not knowing what was going to happen, she gave me a blank calendar and she said, "I understand the the type of training you just went through, and I'd like you to help our community." you put classes on this calendar whenever you want and it still gives me chills and I'm still teaching there 11 years later. Wow. So, so I, I'm a, a huge advocate again for the food for life program because I take it seriously. People who go through it, take it seriously. 
but so does the community. It's a big deal. It's a really big deal. That's outstanding. That's so, outstanding. Um, so, um, so the, yeah. Okay. So the center for plant-based living, uh, the nation's first plant-based nutrition education, culinary center, all those words, uh, jumbled up, I guess. Um, you know, in 2017, I'm laying in bed awake and I'm thinking, you know, I've, I've done these things like I've teamed up with Forks Over Knives and created a program that was very successful for people. And I've, I've you know, done these summits here in town with Dr. Jim Loomis and all these different things to hopefully help people out or help themselves out, really. That's what it's about. And uh, and then you see people who have reversed their type 2 diabetes or on the road to or they're losing weight anyway they're feeling better, they're looking better, they are better. But what what is that thing where they start to add the foods back into their diet that got them in trouble in the first place? Why, what is that? What's that, what's the impetus to that? And I'm also a, um, I went through Well Coaches um, coaching program. So I'm a certified health and wellness, wellness coach through them. And so I, I started like thinking more on the coaching level and I thought, gosh, I think it's support. You know, whenever, think about it this way, whenever somebody makes a lifestyle change, whether it's trying to exercise more or quit smoking or quit drinking or whatever it is, it's kind of easy to find that support, right? I mean, it's it's, it's pretty acceptable. But when you start, when you make a diet change, okay, you are the only one doing that. You're on a solo mission. And by the way, now you're the weird one. So it, without support to help you, it's really tough to stay the course. So I thought, you know, there's got to be somebody around this country who has a brick and mortar who does this thing that's in my head. And so I called some people who I, I know that you know, uh, who are very high up in this plant-based world, um, who I'm very just honored to be friends with as well. And I said, listen, this is what I'm thinking about doing can you tell me who else is doing this so that I can go to them, pay them for their time and their knowledge, and then create that in St. Louis? We need support. They said, no, that's not happening. I said, why not? They said, because nobody wants overhead. Everybody's doing what you and so many other people are doing. They're, go they're service based. They're going to other people. And I said, that's ridiculous because if somebody is dealing with a cancer diagnosis or type 2 diabetes or just needs support in for anything plant-based related, I and everybody else should not be a moving target. They need a place to go. So that was in 2017. So for two years, I saved everything I had. And on the anniversary of my dad's passing, which was August 13th, 2008, we opened up the plant, the Center for Plant-Based Living in his name. So um, it was really quite a day. And, and I'm so proud to have this. And, uh, and up until uh, for seven months, we were gangbusters, people in and out of here all the time, full classes, you name it. And then we had COVID. But, you know, a lot of people have that story. So, um, but you know what, we may, we've made it. We're nearly out of the pandemic, hopefully, and we're still around. So I'm, I'm really happy. We're, I'm really happy and I'm really proud of what everyone's done here. No question about it. And uh, I'm just, I'm still in awe. I know that uh, you're there right now and that's your, your kitchen uh, at the center and it's absolutely gorgeous. Um, what type of classes are you offering now? I mean, I assume it's, it's a little bit more in depth than just going in and, and learning how to cook. I mean, it's a culinary education center. So you know, walk us through what the programs are like. So we do a lot of different classes and just like straight plant-based, whole food plant-based cooking classes where I demo three to five recipes and everybody here gets to taste it and they also take away the recipes. I love it when people, and it just happened last week, we had a big class last Saturday. People were talking with each other, meeting, meeting each other, changing, exchanging of phone numbers and email addresses. It's just the coolest thing, the support that just kind of organically happens. Now, also with Jim Loomis being our medical director as well, um, he comes in town four or five times a year. And we are, when we get together, we do kind of this doc and chef thing where 
Jim, and I, I know the science also, but he really takes the lead on the science when he's here. So I like to tell people he lays down the science and I show you what it looks like on a plate. I show you what the science looks like on a plate. So then I'm, I'm the chef part of that. And we like to call this little song and dance culinary literacy. And that's really what we're doing here. It's not just cooking classes, it's culinary literacy and under, beginning to understand all about food, not just where to find it in the grocery store or where to find it in the farmer's market, but why it's helping you and what it's doing to your body and all the different ways you can get all of these nutrients. And how, I mean, it, it's just a whole comprehensive understanding of why and how food affects your health. And again, we just call it culinary literacy. Absolutely beautiful. And I know the, uh, the chemistry that the two of you have together, I'm sure it's, it's not just a class. I mean, it's a full blown show, you know, dinner and a show. I'm sure that that's almost exactly what, what, what it is. Um, how many people have come through your doors now? Do you know? Oh gosh. Well, no, but that <laughs> that's a good thing though, right? Too yeah. many to count. Yeah, definitely a lot. And really since the pandemic, um, so many new people. I mean, so many new faces. And and I just think that, you know, because of the, you know, the popularity, I guess, if you will, of a plant-based diet, um, and, and so many people are beginning to understand, again, that super highway between food and, and, and health. Um, it, you know, the walls are up, we're here to serve. And, and it's, people are still coming in and new people are still coming in. That's great. That's, that's fantastic. Um, what's, what's on the horizon for you? I, I mean, I would assume more and more and more classes, but, uh, you know, if you could kind of blow out the candle and make a wish, what would that be? Um, so I will say that this, um, doc and chef show that Jim and I have coming up on YouTube is really, that's, that's a big thing. Um, it'll highlight the center for plant-based living. Yes. But, but more so it will help people understand in bits and pieces, as you were saying, a very comprehensive way of looking at food. So um, we wanna just really build that library. So for instance, you know, maybe Jim and I will be at the farmer's market and he'll talk about the nutrition in nightshades, right? And kind of debunk some of those myths and then talk about the nutrition. And then we'll come back here in this kitchen and I'll make a couple of meals and, and walk you through some recipes. So it's, um, we're pretty excited about that. We've done a number of things around the country too. And we have a couple of things uh, coming up later on this year, but it's, it's, a, good, it's a good time here and I just, there's so many things that warm my heart, especially when people come into the shop. We've really just called this place the shop. Um, when I see people, as I did last weekend, exchanging numbers and, and you know, me having to say, okay, everybody, let's get going, let's get going, because they're already talking and they're already so excited and they're already meeting each other. Like, that's just huge. Like, we can build that support system here in St. Louis and beyond. There's just there's, there, you know, you just take it from there and it's really never ending. I love your concept. I love that you are the first through the door with this concept. I love what it is that you're doing and building healthier lives and showing people a healthier way. And just, I mean, man, you really are doing just some extraordinary work out there, Karen. And I, I'm so thrilled for you, um, for that for your community um, and for your own personal health. I mean, what a long and winding road it has been to get here. And the future for you is just going to be so fantastic. I, I just, I can't even wait. I just can't even wait to see what's what's next for you. And, and the show with Dr. Loomis, it's just, ah, I'm so pumped. <laughs> so are we actually. Yeah. Thanks very much. This has been a, a long road to get here and we're really excited. We think that we've hopefully are really able to put, put, put the magic together and, uh, and help a lot more people. All right. And here you go, people, a uh, couple of websites that you need to know right now, especially if you are in the St. Louis area. Okay. CPBL dash STL.com. Okay. Center for plant-based living dash STL St. Louis, not Seattle.com. That's where you're going to want to go. Or you can learn more about Karen at STL veg girl.com V E G girl.com. So go ahead and do that. And we've got links to both right now in the show description or in the episode notes.
Karen Dugan, you are a rock star in this community. It has been so great to chat with you. And my goodness, the time has just flown by. Thanks thanks so very much for, for making us part of your day. Oh, Chuck, thank you. This has been a real joy. Thanks very much. If your health IQ was a couple of points higher than it was a few minutes ago, go ahead and like this video or subscribe to the YouTube channel. And to take it even higher, head over to Apple Podcast or wherever you get your favorite shows. Look for the exam room by the Physicians Committee. Hit the subscribe button there as well and help to make your world a healthier place.